So um, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Dan Young, who's with the Entomology Department and WIRC stands for the University of Wisconsin Insect Research Collection. I'm going to ask you the five questions I ask everybody. Where were you born? I was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And where did you go to high school? I went to Portage Northern High School. And where did you go for your undergrad? I went to Michigan State University and I studied entomology. And where did you go for your advanced degrees in entomology? For my master's, I went to Michigan State University and studied entomology. For my PhD, I went to Michigan State University and studied entomology. Right. <laughs> and I'm the postdoc. Well, that I did at Michigan State University and it's that hybrid vigor we have. <laughs> uh, today, he gets to talk with us about a topic that was one of the ones that was requested last fall. That's the insect department of everything. Please join me in welcoming Dan Young. Thank you. Well, I'll start out by saying what I emailed to Tom earlier. Uh, I, I'm reasonably well read on this subject, but I've never presented on it before. So we'll see how this goes. So far, so bad. <laughs> it can only get better, right? Um, I actually teach a couple of courses that touch on this. I actually teach a, a, a big course, which stands for first year interest groups. Uh, it's largely for freshmen. And the title of that course is Insect Biodiversity and the Sixth Mass Extinction, where we get into such things as biodiversity, why it matters, the importance of, of research collections in natural sciences. And also we get into things like what we're talking about today, and then also the biodiversity, the global biodiversity hotspots, and have students present on that, do some research. My own interests as Tom implied, I'm director of the UW Insect Research Collection. And of course I use collections in pretty much all of the research that I have going on, which is largely taxonomic. I'm not particularly a numbers person. I did lie slightly. I did my freshman year at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, where I, my majors were math and biology. Um, so I have had, some calculus, a couple of courses, but pretty much at that time I knew I wanted to go to entomology and, and so that's when I went to Michigan State. But I'm, I'm not so much a numbers person, I'm not so much quantitative as I am qualitative, um, and hopefully that will serve our interest here today. But I will tell you that much of the research that's being done on this topic is, is extremely quantitative and therefore subject to all kinds of arguments and counter arguments. And sometimes people spend so much time arguing the point, they kind of lose the forest for the trees, I think. But let's dive in. So since we're going to be talking about the insect Armageddon, wait, that's the wrong slide. No, actually, it is the right slide. I'm going to take you back to Kalamazoo. You asked where I was born. Uh, this is Davis Creek. Uh, not far from where I spent my formative years. And around, I'm guessing around 1945, because my grandfather tells me stories, he used to catch brook trout in Davis Creek. And I will tell you that I haven't done much fishing since I've been in school, but before I did a lot of fishing, I was a pretty damn good fisherman. And I fished that stretch of Davis Creek really, really hard. And if there was a trout in there, I'd have found it. So in 1965, there were shiners, there were chubs, there were sculpins, and this crazy thing, which is a horned dace, that's what they call them in Michigan. I have no idea what they call them here. Uh, there were a lot of rough fish uh, and, and nothing much else. I mentioned that because I think it has a bearing on, on the subject of insect Armageddon. I think it's probably more than an insect Armageddon. But back to the subject, when, when I uh, agreed to the request, well, it was a long time ago. It's easy to agree something when it's far off in the future, right? <laughs> so what my wife says. <laughs> So I Googled insect Armageddon and I guess I'm out of touch because it's a game now. So, so maybe you can actually win. I don't think so, but I think what I was actually getting at more than this was this. 
Uh, some of you probably have seen some of these stories and some of these um, videos and, and images that I'm showing here. They talk more about the apocalypse, apocalypse than the Armageddon, but I think the point is taken either way. So I'm going to quickly dance us through some of the, I think, high points of a few of the major articles that I've read and that I go through with some of my students on the subject area. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to listen to me. You can look at some of those things and probably get as much out of it. Um, Dave Wagner is a lepidopterist. He studies butterflies and moths. Uh, the screen on the, the image on the left was a uh, image from a paper that he wrote with a couple of authors, co-authors, uh, which appropriately was, was termed death by a thousand cuts, global threats to insects. And you can see, wow, there are a lot of them. And you could probably take your favorite non-insect group and put it up there and find the same things happening through all of those different thousand cuts that we see uh, depicted here. But in picking a couple of things from that paper and another one that I'm referring to here, actually a new book, uh, alarming new evidence that insect populations worldwide are in rapid decline. We are on course for an ecological Armageddon because if we lose the insects, then everything else is going to collapse. As I'm guessing most of you know, insects sit pretty much near the base of most ecological food pyramids. And um, what's that game you play where you keep pulling the pegs out to see how long you can go before it's crashing? Um, you don't, you don't want to start taking things out at the base, right? Because that can be really, really bad. Well, short game. Um, now, some people will say, if you look at the bottom paragraph, that certainly disappearance of creepy, crawly, buzzing insects doesn't seem to uh, be a big problem for most people. They would say good riddance. But we cannot survive in a world without insects as they are critical for pollinating our food. There's a tremendous amount of research going on these days in, in pollination ecology. And of course, everybody thinks of bees. In fact, we've got a researcher that's been visiting our research collection for the past couple of days, looking at our bees and coming up with some very interesting new discoveries that she didn't know about before, even though she's been studying bees of the Southern Great Lakes area for about 20 years. So yeah, good on our collection. Uh, so pollinating insects, but also which people don't again think of terribly much as they're such incredibly important scavengers and, and those things at the base of the food chain that they don't get thought about a lot of when they do get thought of, it's not necessarily in a good way, uh, but are so incredibly important. If we didn't have insects, we'd be knee deep in decomposing, you name it. Um, you know, th those deer that you see all over the sides of the road, Dad, a uh, couple of weeks, you turn them over, they're gonna be seething with maggots. Uh, not many people's favorite subject, but <laughs> those deer get reduced in a hurry. And the only thing that can even possibly compete for that resource material uh, would be bacteria. So, so insects are incredibly, incredibly important uh, in, in recycling nutrients. In fact, um, we commonly think of, of earthworms as being everything that people want. Oh, I'm a farmer and I'm really into earthworms because they're good for the soil and yay earthworms. Um, again, many of you probably know this, but earthworms are not native to this part of the world at all. Um, so so our, our real recyclers are the insects. One of the papers, the research papers that really got the presses going in a popular sense was this one, um, where a long-term study was done by the numbers, uh, at least partially by the numbers, looking at biomass, not species themselves, but biomass, where there was a long-term study in Germany uh, that looked at uh, differences in the, in the volume of insects that were taken in the trapping systems. And this is over a very, very long period of time. Um, our understanding of the extent and underlying causes of this decline is based on the abundance, uh, is not based on the abundance of single taxonomic groups rather than, uh, but rather change in biomass. Uh, so I, I work mostly at the, at the species level, looking at individual species. This was looking at aggregate bi biomass to, to, uh, to look at the idea of, wow, over the years, the, the amount of raw biomass has changed massively. Uh, some of the same traps that these folks in Germany were using uh, to, to make this study are traps that I've used in Wisconsin for, well, for, for a long time, for 40 years. 
okay, more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I never thought to look at the overall numbers. I never thought, I mean, this was very perceptive of these folks to save all that material and weigh it and look at the amount of biomass differences. Um, normally when we run our traps, we're looking at particular groups of insects or whatever that we're interested in. We pull those out, we curate them, we get them into the collection, we research them, we study them. Um, but again, somebody who would be thinking quantitatively, that would be an important thing to consider. Again, back to that article written by Dave Wagner and others. Uh, in addition to the loss of rare taxa, rare taxonomic groups, um, many reports mentioned sweeping declines of formerly abundant insects, raising concerns about the ecosystem functions. So we could think of some things that we typically think of as very common and abundant, like bumblebees, like monarch butterflies, some of the, the poster children of the insect world. And again, you've probably seen lots of things in the press on declines in those formerly very common species. When I grew up in, in, in southwestern Michigan, um, going out and collecting, because I've done it for a long time, because I was in 4-H, uh, the nine-spotted ladybird beetle, Coxinella novum notata, was everywhere. In fact, the nine-spot ladybird beetle is the state insect of the state of New York. In the state of New York, they have not seen that species since 1982. We had our last record, it's in insect research, insect research collection down, down, down the road a bit. I think that one was from, I think it was the about 1985 or so. I think it was the last specimen that, that we had uh, documented. Um, Again, when I grew up in southwestern Michigan, there was an extremely large burying beetle, the American burying beetle, and that that has all but gone extinct throughout the entire country. But it was once extremely common from the east coast all the way to the Great Plains, and has all but disappeared. We actually thought it had had been virtually gone extinct, except for one little population on an island out in the Atlantic. And then uh, a lot of us started doing surveys of this particular group of beetles, the bearing beetles, to try to see if it was maybe still here hiding somewhere. And we did, my, I and my group did a, a statewide survey for about four years in a row, um, putting out traps with dead fish to attract these things, which are scavengers. And um, actually came up with a new state record of something we didn't know was here, but we never found that species. And then a former student of mine uh, out in South Dakota discovered a population. And it turns out there's a very large population out in that part of the country. So there have been some reestablishment efforts. And so that is potentially a successful story. We'll have to see what the, what the, how that plays out. But there are a lot of things that we knew were formerly extremely common that seem to have all but disappeared or disappeared. Sometimes we know why, and sometimes we don't know why. Um, one of the things that was on that death by a thousand cuts that might explain some of the differences in our real common insects is a, a really important one that again doesn't it, it gets some press but i don't think it gets maybe the amount of attention it deserves is invasive species uh, things that are invasive uh, don't come with their normal uh, cadre of biological suppressing groups their natural enemies and so when they're here they tend to really, really run havoc over everything. Uh, some of them eventually come under a bit of control naturally, um, but it, it takes a long time. And, and many of our ecosystems are already in pretty much in peril. I don't know that we, that we have that amount of time. No. No, I know. I'm a dog lover, but I do like tigers. <laughs> I'm from Michigan, did I say? Go Detroit Tigers. Yeah. They, they won, they, I think they won. Series in 1982. Anyway, yeah, I know this isn't an insect, but it's 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 a useful story because again, I'm sure being one of our large charismatic megafauna, people know about tigers, and they're concerned with the fact that there are only about 13,000 left, and more than half of them are in captivity. Um, yeah, that's that's not a good sign. And take your favorite mega diverse. 
charismatic mammal, um, polar bears, elephants, you name it, um, problems, big, big problems. But in the entomological world, many of us would, would, would love to see 13,000 specimens of a particular species. Uh, this is a species that I describe, and when we, when we name something a new species, it's called describing it. You, you formally write a paper that, that describes what it's like. This is a species, a, a new species of the Asian genus Pseudopyroproa. Uh, this was from the Chiang Mai district in Thailand, and uh, it comes from a wonderful chain of mountains, the Doi Inthanen Mountains, a picture there in the, in the right center. Uh, I'm going to go there. Uh, but I, I may be getting away. It's, it's a national park. So thank God it's a national park, right? So if it's a national park, nothing like this can possibly, whoops, that's the same national park. Mm -hmm. Parts of it are still intact. Um, but this species that I described several years ago, you know how many individual specimens there are known to science? It, it's not 13,000. It's not 1300. It's not 13. That's it. There's one specimen. And that's in a collection in Germany. There's only one specimen of the species ever, ever taken. Does that mean that it's threatened and peril? I don't know. Uh, if, if there are habitats that still look like this, it could be fine. Uh, this group of beetles, at, when they're immature, is a larvae. They, they live in decaying, coarse, woody debris, so down logs. You would think in forest down logs would be pretty common, so it could be okay, it could be safe. But there's there's a lot of this going on in that part of the world in Southeast Asia. I'll come back to that group a little bit later. A recent spate of high-profile reports of impoverished insect faunas from Europe and from the globe have drawn attention of all of us, I think. Um, to, to what sort of subtly has become a, a, a big issue. Um, not the easiest thing to interpret here, but I think the bottom line is with the groups that were, that were looked at in this particular paper, um, you look at, at, the, at the number uh, just to the right of insects where it says 41%, and then you compare that with vertebrates below 22%, Although we commonly think of many of the large mammals as being very threatened, maybe a generation or two of us left that they'll be reasonably safe on the planet, if that. We're looking at some really big problems with things like polar bear um, and tigers. Um, but by comparison, if you look at, at what we've known from the insects that have been studied, Again, these are these are largely volumetric studies. They're looking at, at, at mass numbers, not individual species so much. Uh, look at look at where we see our, ourselves right now. Trichoptera are caddisflies. Oh yeah, it tells you that right there. Caddisflies are aquatic. Uh, larvae, larvae are aquatic. Adults are fairly short lived, um, and they don't typically venture very far from whatever aquatic system they were in, be it lake, pond, stream, river. Looking down the line, Odonata, um, the dragonflies and damselflies, another one that, that has got some real issues, aquatic immatures. I might mention that um, Monday, uh, I was on the road all day heading up to Superior. One day trip. That, that's a long trip <laughs> for one day. And back? And back. And loading and loading half of a massive, massive collection donation to our research collection, some 30,000 dragonflies and damselflies donated to the collection from a career uh, aquatic ecologist that, that was for most of his career at the, at the field site there at, at, in Superior, retired and now over in the Rhinelander area, but uh, fantastic collection, a fantastic resource. Uh, getting all those things documented will be a, a, a sort of a living palette of, of what is and was here. And, and, and that's important to knowing where we go. 
Uh, so we're very, very happy to get that collection added to ours. But Odonata, uh, we, we already know of several imperiled and threatened species of dragonflies. Um, the Heinz Admiral, e Emerald is one of them that's over on the uh, Dora Peninsula area that a lot of research is being done on. Plecoptera, uh, if you look right here, the stoneflies. Stoneflies are particular, I'm surprised they're not higher on that list because stoneflies uh, have a very unique position that they play a very unique role because the immature stages are not only aquatic, they are very tightly correlated with streams of high quality, um, a high amount of, 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 of dissolved oxygen content. They are one of the first groups of insects that are gone when there's any sort of a point source of pollution. Pollution tends to, to take the oxygen out of the water and, and some of the oxygen requiring, high oxygen requiring species get replaced by things that can tolerate anoxic conditions. Some of the some of the midges that we see that live way down deep in Lake in Lake Mendota as a normal place can also thrive pretty well in anoxic conditions of water. So we start to see those numbers rise when we see these stoneflies that, that are virtually gone. So high quality streams are a requirement for this group. So in fact, it was um, some of the pioneering work that was done on, on stoneflies being used as a, as a biological indicator group, indicator species for water quality were actually done here on campus. Uh, at one time we had an aquatic entomologist in the department. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to rehire that position. Seems odd in the Great Lakes state to not have an aquatic entomologist, but we don't any longer. But he, he pioneered some of the, the work that was actually adopted by the DNR here in Wisconsin and throughout the country, really, looking at aggregate species counts to get an idea of the quality of the water in the streams and rivers and ponds and so on. There have been some beetle groups that have been used for that too down in the south uh, western part of the state. Um, so some of the terrestrial ones, Lepidoptera, those are those butterflies and moths. I don't know why they say butterfly, most lepidoptera are really moths, not butterflies, but um, in coleoptera, the group that I'm most interested in, the beetles, uh, orthoptera, by and large, most of those things are, are terrestrial, and by and large, they're feeding, at least many of them are feeding on plants. So when we do things to, to try to control populations of pest species in, in our agricultural and silvicultural situations, we, we're also affecting a lot of non-target organisms. That, that historically has been the case with the types of management strategies that we've had to employ or that unknowingly we employed not knowing what we were doing. Uh, another paper, or maybe it's another shot. I know it is a different paper. Uh, just a couple of things to point out here. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, A, trends in insects that have had their extinction risk assessed. Uh, there are exceedingly few species of insects that have even been assessed. People look at all the lists of endangered and threatened species, and they're like, well, most of those things are plants, and they're mammals, and they're not, there aren't that many insects that are threatened or endangered. No, that's not the picture. The picture is there aren't that many we looked at. Okay. We have no clue how many species of insects there are. There, there are um, close to 2 million that have been named, that have been described, that have been formally written and, and given a Latin binomial name, but um, most of ours have not actually been assessed. Had we been able to do that by this time, we'd probably have a very different picture of, of where we are, and it would be a worse picture, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, this paper looked a lot in B at, at, at population trends in, in the UK and the United Kingdom over the past 40 years. So again, it, it's a reasonably lengthy snapshot, not what we'd hope to see, but, but they have a much longer pedigree of collections-based management information that we can draw upon to, to find out some of these trends. Um, Globally, if we look at, at Lepidoptera in the bottom left there, uh, Lepidoptera in general, the butterflies and moths, and then all other vertebrates, invertebrates, excuse me. Um, it's clear throughout all of these studies that it's decline, decline, decline. D, looking at just uh, Lepidoptera, disturbance versus non disturbed area, shouldn't be at all a surprise, but there are some data 7.6 times more species 
and 1.6 times more numbers. So this is both quality and quantity. Uh, butterflies on, on undisturbed versus disturbed sites globally. In disturbed sites, you may get extremely large numbers abundance wise, but the species richness, the number of species tends to be quite low comparatively. There are, of course, counter studies and counter arguments. Uh, this paper was put out a couple of years ago by Michael Frostley and, and some co authors. I know Michael really well. He actually did some of his graduate work here, work here at the UW. Uh, unlike me, he's very much a numbers person and knows how to take large, large, large data sets and manicure them. Uh, unfortunately, well, let's just say that in, in his analysis, uh, there was a lack of overall increase or decline consistent across arthropod feeding groups which was similar to heavily disturbed versus natural sites. So what he was basically saying is in the massively large data sets that he examined, he didn't see these disturbed, he didn't necessarily see, see a, a definitive evidence of the kind of decline some other authors had been talking about. Uh, the ink had hardly dried on that when there was a counter paper uh, suggesting that the work will rely on a key but flawed assumption that sampling was collected in a consistent way over time in each data set. Uh, some of these massively large data sets were, were assembled from long-term ecological studies that are being conducted throughout the country. Uh, but again, what the author Welty and others were saying was, yeah, I see your data sets and I can make them do whatever I want as well. But you, you're, you're making an assumption that the way the data were collected is, is uniform throughout, and clearly that's not the case. And, and Welty had all looked at some particular sets of parts of that data set. Um, he just shows a couple here, the Kansa Prairie grasshopper data set uh, has some, some, some real flaws in terms of uh, not what the numbers are, but what we can really glean from them um, in an unbiased way. Um, here's me in 28. I, I could, I didn't have the COVID pounds then. I was wearing that t-shirt pretty well back then. Uh, this is Labonte Creek out in Wyoming. I teach a, I teach a summer field course every other summer. And well, before COVID, uh, we would go up to um, the Rockies of uh, Wyoming and the Black Hills for a couple of weeks with a bunch of students camp remotely and, and try to get them just totally away from everything, including cell phones, and, and have them just do some nature journaling, journaling about things they saw. These would be mostly uh, seniors, entomology majors, um, and, and giving them a chance to, to you know, get out of the classroom and, and get out of harm's way and just sit and get totally soaked in to a situation and, and do journaling about things they were seeing, things they were interested in. And when, when they are off running around, I did my own thing. And I, I happen to know that there's a group of beetles of that historically inhabited the stream. Uh, they're actually called trout stream beetles. It's a very small family. They're only about a dozen species. They're in Western North America and in the mountains in China. And um, I was looking for this species and found it. And what I was looking at was in some, there's this, this sort of detritus that floats on top of the water, um, the, the flotsam it's called. Um, these beetles, the larvae will, will crawl around on the underside of that flotsam and they're predators. And what they're feeding on is, remember those stone flies that are indicators of high quality streams? That's largely what they're feeding on. They're feeding on those stone flies. Uh, so again, this was 2008. Um, here's our creature, um, trout stream beetle, uh, Amphizola conti. Yeah, this one is uh, where where I was collecting in Levante Creek was the easternmost known location for that particular group of beetles, that that family and that species. And historically, I, I went back there every other year, and for about 25 years, I was able to always find a couple. Uh, each year, it got harder and harder, but I knew exactly what I was doing, and exactly what I was looking for. I knew exactly how to not get wet. Well, I didn't know that. I, I always got wet. Those rocks are slippery, but but it was worth it. 
um, bumps and bruises, and always was able to find. Um, yeah, for the past 12 years, I've not found one. Same places I always found them. Always, 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 always found them. Uh, this is in a national forest. One thing that we know, maybe you all know this about national forests, is that they commonly are open up to grazing. Uh, when cattle get into a stream, it's not a good thing. Uh, they 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 get made very muddy and shallow and silty. Um, the trout tend to drop out, except in a few nice uh, ripple areas and pools. Uh, those giant stoneflies that the larvae of these beetles are feeding on are getting harder and harder and harder to find. Still do, um, but um, for yeah, for about the past 10, 12 years, I've not been able to find this species there. Been away since 2019 with COVID, so maybe, maybe, but I don't, I don't hold out a lot of hope for that species in that river system. That that Levante Creek eventually flows into the, the Platte River, which I'm guessing may be a problem. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm I'm not going to paint an entirely bad story. Uh, I'm going to give you this one because it's, it's not even out yet. These are the page proofs of an article that I just wrote um, on, a, on a fly. I, I'm a beetle guy, but I, I think flies are kind of cool too. Um, the rest of the macro, a little, a little fungus gnat. This fungus gnat was originally described the first time it was understood to be a different species and named. The, the locality where it was collected, we call that the type locality. The, the place where the original specimens came from that, that went to the person that, that wrote up the description of that species and the rest of the macro. The type locality is Whitefish Bay. Now, I know where Whitefish Point is in northern Michigan, but I didn't know where Whitefish Bay was, so I Googled it, and there it is. It's about eight miles from the epicenter of Milwaukee downtown. I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and tell you that that species has probably been extirpated from its type locality. It probably no longer exists where it was first described from. So I was pretty impressed when I found this species again. Um, just a few years back up to the north of here in one of our wonderful nature conservancy and, and uh, preserved areas up in the Bear Blue Hills, one of my favorite places to go, Hemlock Draw. And so I, I put up some traps. These are similar to the traps that were used during that German study that first talked about the insect Armageddon or apocalypse. Uh, there's the species, isn't that cool? I could easily see that in one of the cantina scenes in Star Wars. Yeah. Um, reading about it, trying to find more information about it when I was getting ready to put this little paper together, uh, I discovered that in Oregon <coughs> and in Japan, there are some other species in the same genus. <clears throat> and what's been discovered is that they are extremely, extremely specific, specialized pollinators on certain flowers in the saxifrage group. And we have no idea what it's doing in, which we're glad that it's still alive and well in Wisconsin, the first time it's been collected in a hundred years. Um, but presumably since we had the foresight to do a pretty good job of, of, of setting aside at least some of the sites in the Variable Hills, it should be in pretty good shape. We don't know what it does, but I, I've been <laughs> talking well, I've been talking with a colleague in the herbarium, another very important natural history collection on campus. And she, I said, well, here's the deal. Here's this Norista, the, here's what it does in Oregon. Here's what it does in Japan. Here are the flower species that it's specialized on. Can you give me some candidate species? What might it be doing in Wisconsin? And she said, oh yeah, here's two. There's two species of flowers in the Saxonburg AC that you should look for in the spring. And it's spring. It's totally spring, I think. Right? It, it, it's also the right, it's also the big dance. It's also NCAA. And you know what always happens during NCAA? No problem. In fact, when I went up, I digress. When I went up to Superior, I ran into a horrible snowstorm in Eau Claire. Cars off the road. This is Monday. 
from about 20 miles east of Eau Claire to about 20 miles north of Eau Claire, it was a whiteout. Cars, trucks, and the ditches everywhere. I got north of there and it was blue skies all the rest of the way up. When I came back, that was the same thing now. When I came back, that snow was all gone. All melted? All melted. There were about three inches, real wet, heavy snow was all gone. I'm thinking, wow, the towing services made a killing <laughs> over those couple of hours. I mean, there were a lot of cars and trucks in the ditches. Anyway, we are hoping that spring is here. And, and I'm going to be going out with one of the advanced classes that I teach. We're going to be looking for those flowers and seeing if we can find these little guys and gals. This happens to be a gal. Uh, if we can find these guys and gals pollinating them, because I have a suspicion, a very strong suspicion based on data, that this is a potential obligate pollinator for those particular flowers. So yeah, it's not only bumblebees and honeybees. There are lots of beetles and flies that are extremely important pollinators. Just go after the flower. Here are my two candidates. Uh, these are the two that, that our curator and the herbarium said to look for. And so uh, I'm gonna have her trail out with me. She's looking for an excuse to get up the hemlock draw anyway, right? Get out of the collection, get out of the wild. So we're gonna be looking for these and we know it coincides with when we've collected the um, fly. So we're hoping that, that we can put two and two together on that. That'd be a fun discovery. Also, Kind of reflects important natural history collections, both botanical and, you know, in case it's the insect. Okay, well, that was the good news. Now back to the bad news. Um, again, the, the group that I spend most of my time working on is a small family of beetles. And when I say small family of beetles, um, I'm like the world's expert on this family of beetles. Ooh. Oh, Because yeah. <laughs> um, no one cares. <laughs> uh, most entomologists don't even know what they are. But when I talk about a small family of beetles, I'm saying about, about 250 species. So by insect standards, that's like no one would even have heard of those things before because they're, they're so nondescript. There's only a couple of species. Are you kidding me? Why even work on those? Uh, but this group is, is, we have them here. We certainly have them in the U.S., uh, around the world. But this particular genus that I already mentioned, Pseudoparacroa, is, is largely associated with, with Asia, uh, China, Southeast Asia, get a little bit down the Himalayas into India, down into um, the, the um, uh, Sunda area, the mm -hmm. Indonesia, um, Malaysia, and so on. So I, I went through in late preparation for talking to you folks, and, and I, I decided to do a little bit of tallying, Ooh, numbers. Okay, well, it was innocent a number. So we currently know of, I know 54 species in this genus. This is one of the larger genera uh, of this particular family of beetles. They're called the fire colored beetles. So in this genus, in the entire world, there are about 54 described species. There are some that still I know that are undescribed. That, uh, give, me, give me time. Um, of those 54 species, eight of them including this one, I only know from one individual. There's one specimen in the world, it's ever been collected. Two specimens, uh, there are two species that we know of from only two individual specimens. Uh, how about three to five specimens? If you have three to five specimens, there are nine species of this genus that are only known in the entirety of the global knowledge of this group. Um, and again, because I am the living expert on this group, I've studied these things all over the world. I've studied them in the wilds. I've studied them in museums and in, in Indonesia, in, in, in Paris, in Berlin, in London, and people from all over the world send me stuff of this group because they know that they want to get a name on, but I'm the one that can do it if it's got a name. Um, so, so I'm pretty comfortable that I know what's out there. It's not like, Oh, Joe Blotz has got 50 of these in his backyard. There may be, but they've never been put into collections anyway. Six to 10 specimens, 12 species, 11 to 20 specimens, five species. So that means two thirds of the members of this genus, 36 species are known from somewhere between one and 20 specimens, individual bodies. 
not talking about the 13,000 tigers. Tigers don't have lungs. Are these things still alive and well? They, they could be. They very well could be alive and well. But, but this genus is most diverse in China, Thailand, Myanmar, India, Malaysia, Indonesia. Those places are becoming hideously disturbed ecologically because of needs for agriculture and, and they don't resemble too much what they did even 75 years ago. So, so they very well may be still out there okay. They certainly have not really been explored in any way. Oh, my freaking tongue. How will make this thing go away? I just yell at it. Yell at it. Well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't help when I thought of putting this together and Joni Mitchell, who I always loved. I guess I'm more of a uh, contemporary. Yep. <laughs> I'm talking to the right audience. Uh, yeah, but it, it, it struck me uh, how vividly true this, this statement of this song really is. It plays over and over and over again in my head. So with that, I hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> By physical characteristics or something more sophisticated than like human? Uh, I, I, sophisticated. That's kind of like Zoom, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, in this particular group, if you're a male, we can generally tell who you are. If you're a female, eh, maybe not so much. Um, some of the characteristics, since you brought it up, some of the things that helped me determine that this was a new species, it wasn't like anything else that we knew before. Um, this particular genus of insects or beetles had, you might notice that there's something rather strange going on right here in the head. There are a pair of recessed little pits with some, some cetacean, dense cetacean on top of that. That would tell you it's a male, females don't have that. But what we know from studies we've done on North American somewhat related species, is that it's a site of sexual selection. Uh, females basically pick out their boyfriends by walking up to them and sampling some glandular material that's inside of those cranial structures. Mm. And if the male can't put out, she won't have anything to do with them. <laughs> so so because, it is a, because it's a site of sexual selection, it's under a great deal of selection pressure, which means from one species to the next, these things are very, very specific in terms of the way they look. And also the, the antennae, and again, particularly of the male uh, for finding the female, which are, those are largely basic, you know, big old uh, discoverers of perfumes that females might be putting out. Uh, those are under a lot of selection. So by looking at those features in this particular group, those are the main things that we use to determine what species are. Does that mean that more sophisticated mechanisms for doing so might not be able to cooperate? I'm sure it would. Um, when you've only got one to 20 specimens known in the entire world, there are very few of those that are gonna lend themselves to molecular studies. Um, when I look at these specimens, most of them are in collections in, well, most of them are in collections in Berlin, Paris, and London. Uh, and they're more than 100 years old. Um, we can, we're getting better at being able to retrieve molecular information from those kinds of specimens. But if I've got one individual, <clears throat> I, I'm not gonna be wanting to cut it up and, and look at little bits of it genetically. Um, I'm hoping that, that some of the groundwork that, that people like myself do um, to point these things out will enable other folks to go back and look at a different way. One of these things that's known from under 20 specimens, um, I can tell you a little bit more about it. It is it's a Chinese species, and right now I have a graduate student in China, actually stuck in a room right now in China because COVID's going nuts there again, and he's from Nanjing, which is one of the two cities that's under lockdown. Um, but he was doing some collecting uh, for his own project, but also with a different group of deals, but also helping me with some of my stuff and looking at immature, the larval stages. 
and, and doing comparisons of their anatomy as well. As I mentioned, the larvae live in decaying wood, under, usually under bark of decaying wood, and, and they have sort of a, a thing on the back and that helps them push themselves along in that under bark area of the world. And that is the site of selection for the larval stages. So we can tell the species apart pretty readily by looking at that. But what we haven't been able to do very well is match up the larvae with the adults because they don't look anything alike, right? So we have to rear the larvae in order to see what adult they become. And then, oh, then we can work backwards and describe the larva and know what it is. And another new species that was recently discovered and I described with another colleague in China, we actually did because we reared that one and had a lot more specimens, we were able to do some molecular work with that. And lo and behold, our morphology is good. And I mean, generally speaking, I mean, generally speaking, molecular evidence is nothing more than morphology on a smaller scale, right? You wouldn't expect things to be extremely different because they're the same animals. Those, those molecular bits are coding for things that you see externally. So it should all work out. So why exactly are all these species disappearing? Insect cells live in warm weather and we're having global warming. Why aren't they increasing? Some are, there are some, well, some are increasing because they're moving north. Um, when I first came to Wisconsin back in 1982, um, it would be exceedingly rare to find a praying mantis. And if you found one, there would be one of two reasons. Either somebody got into one of those natural gardening magazines and ordered an egg case and brought it up and it pushed wow. out and there were, or on a nice warm summer, you know, the, the Great Lakes are a real flyway, a real corridor, and we get southern species that will that will really work themselves way up into the further areas north than they, than they normally would be because they go right up along the lakes. Um, and those are the only two ways you would ever find a praying mantis in, in Wisconsin when I first came here. Now, um, you know, in the fall, uh, if I'm, my oldest daughter is a teacher and she does a lot of coaching and she does a lot of chaperoning at the high school football games and you go to the football games and the lights are on you see praying mantis, praying mantis are flying around um are they overwintering here i'm not positive of that yet um but I, I suspect that's a group that's making a move north um some of the butterfly species are making a move north of course it it gets to be complicated because of the ecology all right they have to it's hard to it's hard to displace a, a natural community. For example, when when we think of earwigs, okay, we have one really common earwig, which was also not common when I first came here in 1982. Kids have an earwig in their collection. Sweet, I'll train you for one of those. Yeah. And now, now you couldn't give them away, right? Uh, that's been since I've been here. That that's been since 1982. And and when I was when I was cutting my teeth at Michigan State. Um, you couldn't find earwigs. You'd have to go across the river to Ontario where they were pretty common. By the time I left Michigan State, you could go right in the back of the Natural Sciences building in the garden and find them all over the place. Now you can find them here all over the place, but, but you probably won't find them up at Hemlock Draw, Backwards Hollow, all those nice natural areas because things that are kind of invasive, they have a hard time getting a foothold in really nice natural communities. So that web is pretty tight and it's hard to break into. Uh, so, so another reason that we might not be seeing that happening very quickly is because of the, the tight webs that, that are woven. Yeah. Uh, but so many of the insects damage. Some years ago, um, there was a, a report on insects that had adapted to the warmer climate and uh, pretty much cleared out the spruce forest in West uh, Colorado. Um, Japanese beetles, everybody who has any kind of a garden or anything growing knows what a scourge they are. They're pretty though. And, <laughs> okay, that didn't work. <laughs> they are pretty though. Yeah. Well, I, I, a couple of years ago, um, one of the uh, basswood trees in my yard was struck by, by lightning. Um, it, I kept watch on it, 
it made a slice in the bark. Uh, and it seems to be growing okay. And I understand the xylem and the way the food goes up and so forth. But one day I saw some beetles on it and I went and wiped them down and my hand went through the entire tree. Uh, the whole inside was, was gone. Uh, beetles do a lot of damage. Probably wasn't, I don't know. It probably wasn't beetles, it was probably ants. It was probably carpenter ants. They'll, they'll get into those cracks, those frost cracks and things like that. Beetles are probably feeding on some sap flowing, I would guess. I don't know if I have to see the beetle. Uh, you, you mentioned two very different ones, though. The, the mountain pine beetle, the one you mentioned with the forests in, in the West, uh, those are species, those are not invasive species. Those are species that have always been here. The problem is, as it's gotten warmer, they've been able to move further, further north in terms of the elevation. So they're moving into elevations where they've never been before. The trees don't have the defensive systems and some of the natural enemies aren't making it up there as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm really well acquainted with it because it, they're out there in the places that I visit when I go out in Wyoming. Uh, and and that it, it can be really, really a massive problem. But again, it's not, it, the beetles are showing us that there's a problem with global warming. It's not that the beetles are being chumps. Okay, the, they're, they're taking advantage of what's given to them. That's a that's definitely a global warming one. The Japanese beetle, totally different thing. That's just a run of the mill invasive species. Larvae are in the soil anywhere around, not anywhere around the world, but where the soil is reasonably similar, they do really, really well because the larvae are subterranean, they're hard to get at. And then adults come out in the US, they come out in massive numbers. Uh, but that's an invasive species problem that that isn't a problem that's necessarily related to global warming, although that will exacerbate them. Yeah, about 10 years ago, the, the colony collapse disorder was all, all of a sudden, you know, here it was all of a sudden. And, it, every, you know, all these people had like really smart ideas about what was causing it, and but you never hear too much about it. Is, is there any, what's the consensus on what's causing that? And is it uh, increasing or decreasing as a problem these days? That's what's causing it. The whole everything. Yeah. Okay. So colony collapse disorder, you're talking about the honeybee, right? Mm -hmm. The honeybee um, is not an is not an indigenous species either. It, it's not, I mean it's the state insect of many in, of many states, but it's it's not from here. It's from southern Europe. And so it when it's here, it's, it's it's in a very different situation than it would have been where where it was wild at one time, and so when you ask what's causing it, it's a, it's a whole it's a whole suite of things. I could probably come to two or three major ones. Uh, there are some pathogens. There's a mite that's a horrible problem. There are some bacterial problems, and of course, they're typically when they're around us, they're grown in massive contained areas called colonies, apiaries, which tend to propagate those kinds of problems because you have a lot of individuals with a little bit amount of space. But the other one is pesticides. Um, you know, before we wised up, we used, we used an awful lot of pesticides pretty much indiscriminately. And a lot of those pesticide granules are just like little colony grains. And then you take the bees and get them back, even if it's, even if it's not deliberately to the hive and so those are probably two of the more major ones, but it, 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 like everything else, it's a really tangled picture that has a lot to do with all kinds of different parameters. Those are, I think, the two major ones, some of the disease pathogens and, and pesticides. Yeah. Well, maybe 10 years ago, we had a summer where we were inundated with ladybugs. Disappeared down to for ages. And maybe three years ago, at least at my house, we were inundated with, we call them worms, they were probably larvae, where we had to go into chemical warfare and we were literally scooping up dust pans and things outside and all sorts of desiccated bodies on, uh, inside the house. Uh, any comment on these phenomena? I don't know what the wormy things were. Um, about three years ago, I was part of the hearing. So three or four years ago. Yeah. Maybe a half an inch in length, still morning, 
I'll have to think on that one a second. That's not the top of my head. But the other beetle that you mentioned, that yeah, called the Asian multi spotted ladybird beetle. How's yeah. that for a common name? And they fit. Harmonia axiris is much shorter. The Latin name is much shorter than the common name. Um, they did. Well, yeah, they weren't really biting. They were just sort of giving you a warm squeeze. Uh, probably after perspiration. Not that you were sweating, but but <laughs> your skin is moist. You're a mammal for crying out loud. Um, so so that's probably what they were doing. They weren't, you know, they, they didn't have anything against you. Um, that's another. Well, I would say it's become invasive. It was deliberately brought into the country. Uh, that particular, a lot of ladybugs were deliberately brought into the country. They were deliberately brought into the country to serve as natural controls for other things that we didn't like. Right? So we find a pest species on an agricultural crop, we go find something that uh, is from its native area, we bring it over and say, yeah, go, go control the population of that thing. Well, with that particular species, with the Asian multi spotted ladybird beetle, um, it was introduced and nobody thought it took. So they reintroduced and they did that about seven different times. And then suddenly, <laughs> they, suddenly they discovered, oh, it took, and now it's everywhere. Oh. And, and what you probably, because I've seen the same thing, what you probably, it's still here, it, it's not going anywhere, but. It's it's like a lot of, of populations of particular invasives that they'll they'll have cyclical pathways. But when they get to be incredibly common, some of their their own natural learning pathogens and things like that catch up with them a little bit. Um, yeah, when I first came here, there was a, there was the seven spot lady reveal, not the nine spot, our good friend, but the seven spot, um, and that one was also an invasive. When I first came here, that was everywhere. Uh, it's been kind of displaced by the Asian multi spotted ladybird. But all of those are, were, were intentionally brought here to control things like aphids and scale insects and things like that. There have been some classical biological control stories that, where they worked incredibly well. Um, there's a little ladybug that probably saved the citrus industry in California when it was first getting started because of an a, of a exotic scale insect called the cotton cushion scale. Uh, so, so there are some definitely some yay, this worked really well, but then it's not a panacea, and, and oftentimes we we underthink ourselves. The the wormy one though, I, I'm not sure what that could have been. I'm still finding desiccated bodies years later. Yeah. Uh, then we'll fix this. <laughs> what type of chemicals besides pesticides are known to have a uh, an effect on insects. You know, other than like pollution and rivers from companies that are dumping. That Anything thing. that would that would inhibit their normal yeah. growth pathways. So, like many things, they have chemical, physiological things that need to be a part of the way they grow. Uh, I can't think of specific chemical groups, families of compounds, but and a lot of the things that are meant to be miticides, that are meant to be fungicides, uh, that would be a major one also because uh, a lot of insects, and us too probably, have a lot of microbial symbionts that we need. And so a lot of those fungicides, even though they're meant not to have impacts outside of the fungi that they're trying to control, probably mess things up internally in, in the insects for the digestion and, and growth and production. On the west side of Madison, where I live, our neighborhood is all trying to keep all the milkweed we can to get back to monarchs. Is that a big reality or is that just a little local effort? No, it's a big reality. It's going on everywhere. Okay. Um, is it working? I don't know. <laughs> is it? I don't, I don't mean to make light of it. Um, the monarch certainly is, has become a spokes insect, a poster child of, of biodiversity. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of folks, that's where it ends. Um, if, if, you, if you do, if you base management on one species, you very well may positively impact that species. It's a lot more complicated with the monarch because it's one of the few insects that migrates. Mm -hmm. So you basically have to have migratory pathways with uh, your, your friends out in Nebraska and, and uh, everywhere else that are doing similar things. But yeah, I, it, there, it's a very popular thing and it certainly is 
not at all harmful. Um, but again, I, I, it's it's one species amongst <laughs> amongst. We don't even know how many species of insects there are in Wisconsin. My estimate is about twenty two thousand, based on the few groups that we know very well. Uh, some of the butterfly species they've been really well studied. The dragonflies that I mentioned earlier have been really well studied. We know how many are here, and we know what proportion that is of the total that we know of. So extrapolating, those are my guesses, about 22,000. But what do we know about the ecological requirements for those other ones? Very little, unless, like you said, unless they're negatively economically impacting, then we, then we study them. Uh, we're lately starting to do a lot more studies of some of the bees because of their importance with, with pollination. But nobody looked at that little fungus gnat, and that may be you know, the pollinator for that particular species or two of flowers. So there's there's just so much out there that we that we need to know and we're running out of time to learn. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid growing up in the Waukesha area, so probably the 70s, I one time I, I came, we lived near Woodlot on a dead end street. I saw like a Luna moth, it was like this big, kind of whitish green. Was that common at the time and it's or is it still common? I don't see them anymore. A lot of the large silk moths, it's in the family called the silk moths, all, all like the, the Polyphemus, the Cecropia, the Cynthia, all of those are in the same group. A, a lot of those were hammered pretty hard by some of the chemicals that have been used to, con, to try to control some other moth populations. Uh, some of the, um, what do they call it now? Spongy moths? Um, but, there's an effort to think hard about some of the common names we use for species that, that are not particularly ethically sensitive. So what we formally probably all recognize is that gypsum moth, I'll say that, is now the spongy moth. It's the same thing. You, you may hear it because it's starting to get into the news again. I've just heard it on my way back from the long trip on Monday. They're talking about spongy moth. I'm like, I know what that is. Uh, but probably a lot of people have heard that that radio show were like, oh no, there's a new invasive called the spongy moth. You know, protect all my sponges. I don't know, but um, <laughs> that that entire group of moths was hit really, really hard by not only the chemicals, but even some of the natural control, uh, some of the bacterial things that they tried to they, like BT, you know, sort of bacillus, some of those that they were putting out uh, for some of those forest defoliating. Uh, moths are, were really tough on, on those things as well. So was that in the 90s? When, or when did they begin? They've been using them pretty much right along. Okay. Uh, are they still here? Yeah, the little moth is still here. Is it as common as it was? <coughs> Probably not. Um, yeah, that would be true of most of those larger moths that we all grew up seeing probably. How do insecticides work? What do they do to the critters? Depends on the insecticide. Uh, some of them are contact, but they, they, they screw up the, the outer body covering of the insect, the cuticle, the hard body covering that keeps it from losing water. So it causes them to dehydrate. Some of them are taken in and they erode the digestive system. It's not a fun way to die. Uh, they erode away the digestive system. So basically they, they, they have you know, problems with digesting food. Some of them are neurological, they attack the nervous system. Some of them are growth regulators. So they start out as larvae and they never get to adulthood. They just keep on becoming larvae and larvae and larvae and then they die because the seasons come around here. Um, from the insect's point of view, it's not a friendly way to go. But then again, when you think of biological weapons, I guess that would be the case with most things, right? Yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all over the map in terms of what they do. Um, they're, they, we certainly try to make them specific to, to a species or a group of species, but that's really hard to do because the physiology across the spectrum of insects is, is relatively similar. In fact, you know, a nerve toxin to an insect is probably going to affect us pretty badly too. Mm -hmm. Our nervous systems aren't that different. All right. Gotcha. Got you covered. You're welcome.